Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Glad Chad Podcast. My name is Jordan Pacheco. And I'm Rudy Carlos. And it turns out, Rudy, that people like us or we're paying way more because we actually have a guest on. If you believe it, you can see <laughs> down right below us. Uh, this is Nicholas Cavazos. Welcome to the Glad Chad Podcast. Nicholas is a fellow YouTuber and his channel is the Traditional Tomist, which is a new and very bright channel. And we predict that you'll probably surpass us probably in a couple weeks, honestly. Like it's, it's, it's content's better, people. Just go watch his stuff. So, <laughs> I'm gonna try. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. Um, before we get started, and even before our audience is introduced to you, um, one, when you reached out to us originally, because we just did a show on your channel, um, you mentioned that you were a fellow pipe smoker. And so I want to know, we want to know if you have your baby anywhere nearby, because this is important. This is your ticket to ride for the show. I, I do. I do. So I got this old guy right here. Hey, he's, Kay uh, Woody. Yeah, he's hand, he's handmade. And uh, I believe it's from the 40s, if my memory is correct. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, fairly decent. I don't mind it. I don't, I'm not honestly, a, I think with pipe smoking, you know, the pipes got to fit the person. Mm. And so for instance, I see like some of these guys walking around, they just have like these really long pipes, but yet they don't have a beard. It just looks kind of weird. You know what I'm saying? I can kind of like they're hobbits or something. Rudy, do you um, have a pipe nearby? I'll go get it. Okay, go get it because I'll show for our audience on YouTube. These are the pipes uh, I like. I know. So when we said hobbit, uh, church warden pipes are my style because I want to feel like freaking Gandalf at all the hours of the night. This yeah, is yeah. That's fair. Yeah, you got a yeah. beard though. No, that works. That's exactly right. So you could pull one off too. Rudy, Rudy should be the grandfather of us all. But I think, I think Rudy has one church warden. We're about to find out what his favorite is. This is actually my wedding present from Jen. Jen had a guy in New York carve this. Nice. Uh, oh, wow, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've smoked it once, and ten out of ten would highly recommend. Rudy, what do you got? This is my my pride and joy. This is a uh, Peterson uh, three hundred seven. <laughs> nice, made in Ireland, and uh, this is my favorite tobacco. Fusilier's ration. Oh, shut up. Really good stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm but, a, uh, I'm a Captain Black cherry, uh, a Captain Black cherry kind of guy. Ah, I get you. I'm sure you guys have seen, at least with the church warden, uh, Father Ripperger's famous photo, him just like <laughs> <Yeah>. chilling, <laughs> yeah. sitting on like sitting on that bench, whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He, he, you know, I saw him at the Augustine Institute because he's him and his order is here in Colorado. So I was just walking in our, in our main atrium. We have a giant crucifix there. And, um, so my buddy was like, Hey, Hey, that's father Ripperger. And so I saw the back of father Ripperger as he walked up the stairs. <laughs> so, oh man. Next guest confirmed. So anyway, thank you so much for coming on to the Glad Chad podcast. And we want um, our audience, this is such an interesting topic. And so before we get to Catholic integralism, which I know so many people have, thank you for your questions and coming in. And thank you, Nick, for not only coming on, but being integralism's ardent defender. You know, if you if you fail today, then that's it. Um, you also have had such an interesting story yourself to tradition and a very recent story too. And so we have a lot of our audience members who are converts, reverts and and so i know that you vibe of course with a lot of that and you talked about that a lot in your channel so why don't you give our audience just a good overview of who you are how you came to the faith and why thomism in particular sure yeah so i was originally brought up in a i would just say non-denominational kind of quasi charismatic background and originally i was actually baptized in the church about three months after i was born, but my parents left the church six months after I was born. And growing up, I grew up in a small town, and so there wasn't a whole lot of churches. And so um, you definitely became close um, to who you went to church with. I was also homeschooled. And so I had like a very tight knit group of homeschool people that I knew who also went to the same church as me. And so uh, growing up, I just had like I would say a very intense love for scripture. My parents, like the one thing um, at least on a spiritual aspect that I really do thank them for is they really did instill in me a very wonderful and healthy love for scripture. And so whether it was, you know, memory verse contests or sword drills, I don't know if you guys know what that is. You guys know what a sword drill is? I know what sword drills are because of Steve Ray's testimony. Ah, yes. So okay. Will you, will you explain to everybody? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So a sword drill is where you take a Bible every, you get like a group of kids, you take a Bible you have it closed. And then the person in charge of the group will say, you know, um, you know, like Psalm 137 two, 
and you have to flip to that passage as fast as you can and then read it off. And first one who, you know, wins gets a prize or, you know, I guess gets bragging rights or something. Oh, and well, so, it looks like that's way unscriptural, lest anyone boast. So. Hmm. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so, um, yeah, no, so I grew up in this atmosphere and uh, scripture was always just very important to me. And my relationship with God was something that um, even as a young child was very present in my life. But as time went on, the church that I was a part of became more and more, um, I would say, hyper charismatic. And so not just charismatic in the sense of like um, it's, it's worship expression, but charismatic in the sense of, um, yeah, just seeking after extraordinary miracles and making them very commonplace. And so I don't mean just people babbling in tongues and things like that. I mean, like, for instance, lay your hands on someone and they're going to start like twitching on the floor and this becoming, you know, commonplace. Mm. And so, you know, I, I think as like a teenager, you know, I saw these things and I, and really that being my only true experience of, uh, you know, is what I perceived as Christianity. Uh, I thought, okay, you know, I need to step into this as well. But then whenever I would try something, um, nothing would happen. And I started asking questions along the lines of, you know, like, am I, am I saved? Am I, you know, holy enough? Do I have enough faith, et cetera? And then, you know, trying to, um, you know, cope with that with things like, well, maybe I'm young, you know, maybe I'm just not experienced, et cetera, you know. Um, but I just noticed how I started, whenever I started to ask questions about these things that I started to get um, kind of shoved to the sideline and people were, you know, telling me things kind of like, you know, oh, you're asking all these theology questions, but, you know, at the end of the day, theology doesn't matter. What matters is a personal relationship with Christ and how they define personal relationship isn't in taking information into our intellects and then like allowing that to guide our will and our interior life as we believe as Catholics, but rather there's, you know, the mind over here and there's the spirit over here and you have to stay over here. And they, mm. these do, don't, they don't touch. Yeah. Um, or if they do touch, it's, it's very superficial. And so me, I was just kind of turned off by this mentality because I really do enjoy learning. I really do enjoy study. And so as I continued to study more and more scripture, I was more or less put off by all of this theology. And so eventually, um, one thing I also forgot to mention is as I was growing up, I also had the desire to become a pastor and to either become a pastor at this church or maybe to start one of my own churches. Um, but as time went on, I just started to see, well, I don't know if becoming a pastor at this church is necessarily feasible. I don't know if this is, um, if this is right. So in my pursuit of truth, I started to, as I'm just a natural lover of history, mm -hmm. I started to seek out, okay, you know, what does um, some church histories say? And so I knew <laughs> from just my upbringing of how my parents taught me what parts of church history to look at and what parts of church history to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that, um, you know, I just remember distinctly, you know, an adult telling me when I was a kid, you know, the Catholic church has the blood of millions upon their hands and hearing this at like seven, eight years old, that really just burns into your, into your brain. And so I started to really dive into the theology of Calvin and Luther. And I really started to become interested in, you know, the, as they would put it, the doctrines of grace, tulip, the five points of Calvinism. And as I became more and more engrossed with this, my uh, anti-Catholicism naturally just increased as well. And uh, eventually that church that I was a part of split into, I would say, like moderate charismatics and then really hyper charismatics. And my parents ended up going to the really hyper charismatic perspective of things. And for whatever reason, I decided to go along with them. And this is probably, it. for those of you who, who have seen my story on my channel, uh, this is whenever I was actually introduced into the philosophy of King James Onlyism, um, which for those of you who don't know, King James Onlyism is a very niche Protestant belief system that's really only held by fundamentalist Baptists. But it's this belief that the King James Version of 1611 or 1769 um, is the only um, infallible and inerrant translation in the English speaking world. Some of them go further and say it's the only infallible translation, period. Um, and some of them even go further than that, saying that it's actually better than the original autographs. 
Um, very few go to that perspective, but that is a perspective that's out there. It's called Ruckmanism, if you want to look into that. Um, and so I became more or less King James only through my study and also as kind of a reaction to all of this charismatic stuff that I was being introduced at home. And so I was basically seeing all this very, very extreme things going on over here and just decided to run in the, what I perceived as the conservative path and just run over here. Well, as I ran over here, I was introduced to many interesting people. Some of you may know the name Stephen Anderson of Faithful Word Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is known as, um, yeah, probably America, one of America's biggest hate preachers now. He's known for uh, advocating the death penalty of homosexuals, uh, the death penalty for adulterers. And um, yeah, it holds a lot of um, disparaging beliefs when it comes to women um, and when it comes to a whole host of other issues. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I got in, I got kind of involved with his movement, so to speak, but then eventually, uh, not to take too much of your time, I was drawn into a, a church out in East Texas. I never ended up actually going, but I was heavily influenced by them. It's called the, and I caution the viewers with, with what I'm about to say now, just because this group is very powerful in the way it, it um, Powerful, not in a good way, but in the way it evangelizes. Uh, it's known as the Church of Wells. And I don't know if you two gentlemen have ever heard of the Church of Wells before, but the Church of Wells, yeah, the Church of Wells was is a, is a group that was founded about maybe 20-ish years ago. And it's a group of street young street preachers. Most of them, when they founded it, were in their late 20s. And um, they are pretty much KJV only, somewhat Calvinistic fundamentalists and um they placed a high emphasis on the new birth and in essence, in their theology, man is totally depraved. So they take that position of John Calvin, that man's will is bound by his nature. So there is no free will. And because his nature is evil and you know, the will can't choose. Um, and that the only way for a man to be justified is by God to choose to justify that person. But the evidence by which God chooses or the evidence that, you know, that you're one of God's elect is in essence that you're sinlessly perfect. Hmm. And so that's a position that kind of separates them from a lot of Calvinists um, in, in all honesty. However, believing in this, this led to a lot of scrupulosity, but also, and this is where I, I thank the Lord, it led to me to a lot of study of scripture. And in my study of scripture, I recognized, yes, there is clearly evidences that are needed for salvation. There's clearly fruits that are needed. But in my study, and, you know, as scruples continued, I started to cry out to the Lord for about two years for him to save me, you know, and in my mind to no avail. And it wasn't until I actually had a good friend who invited me to go to mass with her that Catholicism even became an option to me. Hmm. And so when I ended up coming to the Catholic faith, uh, I remember originally going to mass and um, yeah, knowing what, you know, what mass was in the, in the Catholic mindset. And uh, yeah, it was just kind of your standard um, Nova Sordo mass. And I didn't really feel like I got a whole lot out of it, but it was the sermon that stuck out to me because it was the story of the prodigal son and not to sound cliche, right? Cause we are all the children of the prodigal son, right? Returning home to our father. But I remember in that mass hearing for the first time, um, this idea, like, son, it's time for you to come home. And I recognized very quickly that, okay, yes, it is time for me to come home. It is time for me to come home to the church. And so I decided from that point on to go ahead and to do a lot of study. And long story short, I studied my way into the Catholic faith. And I realized that a lot of the positions that I believed in um, by just studying and understanding scripture had their fulfillment in the place of the Catholic church. Um, it was that plus also an experience with our lady, uh, where I, um, if you want to know the full details of that story, but I, in essence, cried out to Mary to show me the way, uh, to her son. Mm -hmm. And she gave me a lot of supernatural peace about joining the Catholic faith. And so, yeah, that's kind of the short rendition of the story, but I'm definitely glad to be inside the one fold of the redeemer. It definitely uh, is a good thing to, to be home you know yeah us too that's really amazing we're happy that you're here yeah i had a similar experience too um i kind of talked about that in in your last show um but it was a homily that that touched me and and was enough for me to start considering the church also 
I guess uh, priests don't really uh, know what what their words are gonna uh, do or what effect they have, but uh, they certainly have that that capacity. Why? What led you particularly to Thomism? Like for a lot of people, they just kind of stop at okay, I found the Catholic Church and they're happy and it's satisfied. So it's not to bash people who who are on that that range, but you've gone deeper to where your entire YouTube channel. And for those again who haven't seen, we just saw we're on an episode on your channel, which is the traditional Thomist. It's awesome, great. You have a lot of great guests already, which is really fun to see too. Not to mention your own train of thought. So why? Why Thomism inside the whole whirlwind of, of your conversion and everything? Yeah, no. So it was kind of Thomism and the Latin mass that kind of go together. And so uh, I talk about this a little bit in my initial testimony video, but it was going through a couple of really, let's just put it at, put it, I guess, charitably interesting Nova Sordo masses <laughs> um, where I would, you know, I was studying the catechism that I chose to read coming into the faith is the classic Roman catechism, the catechism, the council of Trent. And so mm -hmm. by just reading that and then going and knowing about the changes, you know, um, but then going to the new mass and looking around and seeing people wearing sports jerseys or just wearing immodest clothing in general. And then yeah, guitars and lay Eucharistic ministers. I remember one moment thinking, Lord, I know that this church proclaims that you are God in that host. Right. Um, but I don't think they really believe it. And, you know, this was again, just me, this like time six, you know, that I'm going to the Novus Ordo. And so I remember for a while asking myself, like, do I actually want to convert or not? Because I had the warnings of revelations three going off in my head about, you know, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I was just like, okay, correct theology, but then there's just this massive disconnect with the people. And I don't want to be this like one soul on fire guy amidst like just to see, so to speak, that's just, that's you know, so, put out. That's so interesting that you mentioned that because, you know, a lot of the changes were made to be more hospitable to a Protestant coming into the church, but it was like a, a gut reaction for you to say, oh, I don't know, this isn't right. Yeah, well, no, I mean, so like even just with the one example of like guitars, so, I mean, I'm not, again, trying to bash anyone, but like as Protestants, we just did it better. And so it just, <laughs> for me, for me, it just came off as corny. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, like this. it's like, let's be honest. If you're making a movie, you don't just add good score. You have to good, add good effects in the background. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you go to a lot of larger, like mega church style Protestant uh, churches, it's going to be not just like hard, you know, rock music, but then it's also going to be lighting and fog machines you know, et cetera. But if you have one acoustic guitar and you're in this, this, you know, very bright room where it just doesn't look like it's fitting the place. It's just like one guy in a corner. It's just awkward. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're just kind of standing there like, all right, you know, you know, I'll just, I'll just participate the best way I can. But yeah, no, I mean, it's totally putting off. Nick, and so, I want to, I want to real quick comment on something that you said earlier. You said you're not trying to bash anybody, but even though we are a Glad Chad podcast, we are trying to bash some things. So yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, will, I will definitely bash the system. I just always want to be like, you know, there's so many people that need, I guess, help out of that. Mm -hmm. So to speak. And yeah. for some people, like they grew up in that system. And so I'm like, dang, that sucks to suck. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can try to help the best I can, which, you know, I'm just a mailman right at the end of the day. well it helps it helps kind of you know i i divide you know like there's the the aesthetic the human element that we bring to the mass to the catholic faith you know and then there's there's obviously the the divine truths the capital t traditions you know and so for a lot of protestants for a lot of reverts what it seems like is we rediscover the truth of the catholic faith and then it, it's careful because if people think well if i don't see these truths applied here the whole thing must be false. It's like, no, never mind. Maybe it's just the fact that Grandma Ellen is horrible at, at being a cantor and shouldn't be on the altar in the first place. Hmm, go someplace different. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And so for me, I, I didn't know if I wanted to convert because of, yeah, all these types of things going on. And so there was definitely a period where I was really questioning. But then I remember seeing this ad online for uh, a, a, a requiem mass that was going to be taking place at like 7 30 in the morning it was going to be a high mass and um this was for all souls day and i knew about the latin mass uh, fortunately i wasn't kind of 
I didn't have the experience of just not knowing it existed at all. I, I, I definitely knew it existed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I remember going and sitting in the very back row. And once the, the scola started, my first thought was, this has to be recording. This just sounds too good. Like <laughs> this isn't real. And then proceeding to watch the mass and following along with the missile, I was kind of one of those odd people that didn't ever have a problem with the missile. I just, mm. I just picked it up very naturally. And so I, you know, was following along and of course, yeah. Like if you're studying the council of Trent and the mass of Trent, they're just going to click together. And so seeing God actually honored in a way that was completely foreign to not just my Protestant experience, but then also my very brief stint as a, a person wanting to convert. Um, yeah, it was really shocking, but in a beautiful way. And so it was the Latin mass that convinced me to stay. And that's where I've stuck around. And how that leads specifically into Thomism is, you know, like most Catholics, we look around at the situation that we're in in the church right now. And, uh, you know, it used to be back in the old days that, and this is not an original statement, but that you would go to Rome to get information on your priest, mm-hmm. you know, if what the priest was teaching was okay. But now it seems to be reversed where your priest has to be explaining every single thing that comes from Rome. And it's, it's awkward. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's sad because especially the papal magisterium, the office of the Pope is the only person that can lead the entire world to heaven you know, but yet at the same time, we don't see that happening. And so when I was seeing all of these things, you know, I was coming into the church around the time of the Pachamama events and also seeing the very ambiguous statements that were coming out, not just with that, but then also, um, you know, like with the whole issue with the same sex unions mm-hmm. a couple of months ago, even though, even though, you know, the Vatican has denied that and I'm, and I'm glad they do deny it. Um, but, um, yeah, seeing these types of things was just super confusing to me. And then also looking at what, you know, the theology pre-council looked like versus the theology post-council. And I said, okay, I have to understand what does the faith really teach? And so I actually was introduced to a video by Brian Holdsworth. I'm sure you guys know Brian Holdsworth. And the video is, I think, entitled something to the effect of like Aquinas equals Catholicism or something like that. And that video actually inspired me to like start to get into Thomism. And the more and more I studied it, the more and more I realized one that Thomas's theology, in a certain extent, not totally, but in a certain extent, is the theology of the church, and not kind of just one amongst many theologies. It's kind of the modernist who says um, that Thomism is just kind of like one system of thought amongst many. Mm -hmm. There's a certain sense where that can be applied, but then there's also a very real sense that the popes have defined uh, in, in a certain sense that the theology and philosophy of St. Thomas has to be on is the theology which you know is binding upon the conscience of man in many regards and so if you want to understand what the faith teaches you have to go and understand thomas so i had the privilege of you know reading through much of what thomas has written i've definitely not read all of it i have a lot a lot to go then i got introduced to the thomistic institute which is part of the dominican house of study so it's it's a kind of a lay apostolate of the dominican order so i became a, a member there and uh yeah i just I think what I love so much about Thomas is that he's clear, you know, even though he uses very um, scholastic and heady words, his theology makes sense. And I don't have to wonder what's going on here, you know, what's going on there. I can just have faith that, you know, when Christ says, you know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church, he doesn't just mean that we're all cowering over in the corner, but that we can actually know, love, and serve God in understanding with our minds, with our reason, what he's taught. And so, yeah, I definitely recommend for those of you who haven't like jumped into Thomas, take a leap, you know, it, it, it's definitely a fun pool to be in. There's a there's a good audiobook version of the Sumer that you say used to be one on YouTube that was a pretty decent yeah. read. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But, but I also know like if you ever want to like, I know you talked about on your channel, like actually going through the Summa with with a commentary and stuff like that i know that there's a lot of our listeners who who ought to get themselves into some thomas you know oh yeah definitely. and uh i don't i'm not like a i'm not a i'm like i'm not i've not studied enough of saint thomas um rudy probably has because rudy's cool uh <laughs> <laughs> no to be honest with you i haven't yeah but yeah. you know that's why he's a doctor of the church you know the he, angelic he had, doctor yeah he's the angelic doctor he had uh, a significant understanding of these things and um it really is interesting to go back 
and read uh, some of the documents before the council and see how clear and concise the language was. You know, I've read encyclicals too of like post conciliar popes and, you know, you kind of, you're kind of left wondering like, what did I just read? What is, what exactly did I, did that mean? That whole paragraph, you know, it's like, what, what is he trying to articulate? You know, um, mm-hmm. the writing is so much better. And, and although it's, it's definitely like really heady, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that you, you warn people, uh, about that, but it, despite it being heady, it's, it's actually something that you can grasp and, and understand. Yeah, no, for sure. It took me a good, I'd say year, honestly, before I finally started to get all of Thomas's language down. But, you know, the more and more you start to understand the language, the more and more you start to understand the deeper philosophical trains that he's going on, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight. Um, yeah, the theology of the church and then just reality itself makes so much sense. It's like, okay, it's not just this is what the church teaches, but this is what it means to be a man. This is what it means mm. to be a human. This is what it means to eat and to sleep and to do all these types of things. Yeah, You know, Thomas just makes the world make sense. <laughs> well, I'm happy that you you helped springboard because um, as, you, as there are a bajillion different topics to go on to, especially stemming off from St. Thomas, one thing you talked about earlier that you wanted to, you wanted to tie is that the, the concept of integralism, which is something I'm going to have you have the floor on to just kind of explain to, to us and to our audience, um, is something that also is Thomistic in its foundation. And as you know, on this channel, we don't just talk about the Latin mass and how cool it is and dunking on modernists, but, and, but inside Catholic culture and theology, <laughs> We like to talk about um, the fact that there is this budding revaluation of republicanism versus monarchism that's coming around. We've had guests like Charles Clomont to discuss that. Um, so integralism is, is a funny thing because I see that in monarchy circles popping around, and I'm not I'm not an expert on it whatsoever. Um, I, I kind of know some very general classifications. So for our audience, uh, and we have questions later that Rudy will definitely read from. Thank you for, for people on Instagram who've, who've sent them. But why don't you just give us an overview of what integralism is and how it particularly pertains to St. Thomas and to the Catholic faith? Yeah, sure. So integralism is, you could argue, the political and social um, arm of the church. And a good definition that you could take is that it's the principle that the Catholic faith should be the basis of law and public policy um, in civil society, and that um, Catholic law is what is going to make civil society best at the end of the day. And so unlike Enlightenment political philosophy, so the philosophies of Hobbes, of Locke, etc., Aquinas, in his at least treatment of integralism, sees that the political life is something which um, is not just necessary, but it's part of humanity expressing himself. And he gets this mainly from, from Aristotle. And Catholic integralism, you know, goes back, at least in the context of history, um, you could arguably say to the third century, because, you know, the first couple of centuries of, of Christendom, everybody's underground, everyone's being Mm -hmm. persecuted. But then once Christianity is um, allowed to be practiced openly under Constantine, and then later on um, the official religion, the idea is that the elements of Catholic belief become the law and the basis of civil society. You could say, and this would make more sense maybe for some of your listeners, uh, it's definitely a doctrine that I think is very needed to be harped on, especially nowadays, is the social kingship of Christ. This idea that Christ is not just king of our hearts, which mm-hmm. he is, right, and he ought to be, but that Christ is also king of public society. But where most people, I think, get this wrong in their approach to integralism is that they see this philosophy um, played out or reactions to it in one of two extremes. And so on the first extreme, I think a lot of Catholics, especially here in America and the West, grow up believing because of the culture, this idea of separation of church and state, right? And the idea of separation of church and state is condemned by the magisterium of the popes, especially go back and read the popes of the 19th and 20th centuries. They're very Mm -hmm. clear that it's a no-go chief, sorry. Uh, And then on (laughs) on the other hand, you know, I think a lot of people, when they also hear integralism, they kind of think, um, I guess for lack of better terms, like a hardcore 
theocracy like maybe you'd see in some like middle eastern countries Mm -hmm. and that's not what it is either um there is a distinction between church and state however there's not a separation Mm. and what fundamentally the state has to do is in order to allow the state or allow man to properly meet his ends right the end of his natural end and his supernatural end but specifically his supernatural end being the beatific vision they have to create laws and allow civil society to flourish around catholic principles and so you see this um all throughout the middle ages right most of the middle ages um for all of their faults they definitely had integralism weaved in Mm. i think uh you know king saint louis the ninth is probably the best example of this um where he doesn't he doesn't make the church the law of the land but rather merely as a catholic he puts on laws that are catholic right and so he he keeps that proper distinction you see this movement ultimately fade out starting with the protestant reformation because you know the protestant reformation it's grandfather if you will being the nominalistic philosophy of william of Ockham, this idea that um there is no true essence to objects Mm. um and that we merely associate we merely put names on things uh as a collective um and that there's no real true objectivity to anything this idea was taken and placed upon the bible and then once man could had the idea you know we can interpret the bible however we want this was then applied to the state and everything was starting to be questioned you know Mm. does the state really have to order man to his end and so right and jumping back for a second this idea of ordering man to its end right every man because of you know birth right has an end that he must fulfill right there with everything there's always there's always a start there's a finish there's a cause and there's an effect the effect the end that every man is supposed to meet that god has set us on this train is to reach heaven is to reach the beatific vision in his, as his supernatural end his natural end is to you know um promulgate children to live a life of virtue these types of things mm. um but with this mentality and, and so therefore laws have to be ordered to do this and this makes common sense right if you want to if you want to establish a good society and saint thomas says that the government that ultimately a government's job is to make laws that build peace or concord as he says in a society if you're wanting to do this you have to make laws that are one in accordance with natural law so some ideas that no one would have an objection to or at least you'd hope is yeah sorry guy you can't go out and murder somebody just because you get angry right or you know you can't lie when you're on the witness stand um, these types of things, um, but that you have to also do this when it comes to what's now considered very taboo things like, yes, um, you can't commit adultery on your spouse, right? You cannot, um, yeah, abortion, sorry, you can't do that, right? It's it's cutting off that uh, child's potentiality to, to fulfill its end. Um, and so because of this, you know, this enlightenment philosophies, especially through Locke and Hobbes, is really applied on to civil society. And especially with the catastrophes of the French Revolution, Mm. integralism completely started to fall apart by the time of the 17th century. And then moving on into the 18th and 19th century, you really just started to seeing it come apart piece by piece from this society to that society until about the time of Pope St. Pius X. And this is actually where the term integralism actually starts to first appear. Its concepts were always believed, but the name wasn't really used. And Pope St. Pius X, whenever he was on his glorious hunt against modernism, he uh, there was many pious laity and bishops who started to form different groups. And one of them was called the Society of Pious or the Club of Pious. And this was kind of um, an organization to where lay people would report, lay people or priests would report other priests, other bishops or other theological professors and they would report them as modernists and then they would be you know suspended or whatever and this idea is that we want society to be fully intricately catholic the whole society has to be intricately catholic and so therefore these people were going out and um not to use this as a as a negative term in this context i don't think that that was a bad thing necessarily overall but kind of witch hunting Mm -hmm. everybody 
Um, so after Pope St. Pius X died, uh, his successor, Benedict XV, he, um, you know, obviously Benedict XV, he was not a modernist at all, um, but he was definitely more of a moderate yeah. uh, in, in the whole grand scheme of things. And he actually disbanded much of these groups and he thought, okay, you know, yeah, under the, under the former uh, pontificate, we definitely destroyed and, and, and quashed the modernism, you know, it's, it's no, it's no much of a problem anymore. And then by the time of Pius XI, Pius XI looked around and he saw, all right, by the time, you know, by this time, World War One has already happened. It's the dawn of World War II. He's looking around and he says, okay, well, Western Europe, practically at this point, at least in the sense of its laws, is completely throwing off every vestige it can um, of the Catholic faith. So then that's when he came out with his famous encyclical on the topic of the social kingship of Christ. And he established the, uh, the Feast of Christ the King, which is you know the last Sunday of the year, at least in the ordinary form. And then you know for us Latin mass people, I think it's the, it's the last Sunday of October. And uh, what's interesting about this, though, and this is why uh, the theology really does matter, and you do, you do miss this in the new Mass, is that um, the Pope's intention with the encyclical on the social kingship of Christ was to point out that Christ, as all of Western Europe is apostatizing, to remind the leaders of Western Europe, Christ is your leader, Christ is your God, and you must enforce and enact laws that are in accordance with the law of Christ. Um, whereas now the feast has kind of become Christ King of the universe, which is true, right? That's not, not true, but you, you lose that very specific political aspect that the Pope was wishing. And so then what happens after that is that with Vatican II, you have the famous uh, declaration Dignitatis Humanae on religious liberty that comes out. And that's a very hotly debated um, document, but that in essence crushes any vestige of hope for most intercalists because it does seem to at least give the the civil right for um other religions to practice without one coercion which is what the catholic church has always taught but also gives them the right to practice any form of faith according to their conscience mm -hmm. you yeah. um and so yeah that's kind of the history of it well you know rudy and i went through we we didn't finish it all maybe we should do it for, for a channel thing rudy a live stream like a long one um, but we were going yeah. through Dignitatis Humanae. And our first reaction was, well, this is just kind of reading like an American document, um, which doesn't surprise me because it was hemmed by Americans. But I guess, mm -hmm. you know, as we kind of get to some, some of our questions from, from our, some of our, some of our uh, people on Instagram, one thing that I have is, and in terms of maybe how Thomas found it, you know, I've heard a common critique on integralism is people go, okay, look, it makes a lot of sense to have Catholicism as the basis, people that don't necessarily buy into religious freedom or anything like that. But at what point do you have the conversation of crossing something that's a sin into something that now is also criminal? We know that we know that they're intimately tied. Things in the natural law you discussed. Look, murder isn't just something that is a confession away from salvation. That's actually something that probably needs to be held criminally liable for. But obviously, people kind of squirm when you talk about other sorts of sins. People talk about this with adultery a lot. People talk about this with pornography and sodomy. Um, and so what for an integralist, what does that kind of spread look like when it applies to what the responsibilities of the church are and the responsibilities of civil authorities? Mm -hmm. no, that's a great question. And that's something, I'll be honest, I wrestle with as well. And so, for instance, when I go back and read three main sources, um, St. Thomas, St. Robert Bellarmine and St. Alphonse of Liguori, they all have similar opinions, although they disagree with each other on the extent of how far they should go. So for instance, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, uh, well, actually, I'll put it to you this way. All of the saints, of those three saints, are going to agree that heresy should be punished with capital punishment, as an example. Yeah. St. Robert Bellarmine explicitly also says that those who are forgers should be put to death, right? But when we hear that today, we're kind of like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> you know. Um, but then also, uh, there's some disagreement between the saints. So St. Augustine and St. Thomas both say that, as an example, that though an evil and wicked sin, prostitution should be allowed to be legal. And they use this under the argument that if it, you know, we have to tolerate an evil in order to prevent a worse evil. And what's actually interesting is that what they deemed as the worst evil 
most civil Americans, secular Americans today would consider insane because like the evils that they were referring to were the sins of pollution and self-abuse and things along that nature. Um, and so what's, yeah, you, you find that interesting. And so I guess what I'm saying is I have no clue where the limit when it comes to that should, should be enforced. I do know that there is a natural tendency within man to want to give a pass on a lot of things, um, which is a shame. Um, but then I also have to ask myself the question of in today's modern day, if intercalism was applied, what would you do? So for instance, like with, you know, the amount of like pornography, you know, that, that that's consumed, uh, you know, there, there's reports that as an example that, um, that the time that the most pornography is consumed in America is on Sunday mornings and in the Bible Belt statistically, um, which is a shame. Mm. But the thing is, is okay. Let's just say for hypothetical circumstance, you were to go and arrest all those people. I do think pornography should be outlawed, 110. percent I think it's an evil. I think it should be shut down. Um, however, if you were to go and prosecute all of those people, we would be prosecuting a ton of people. Yeah. And so there's a certain practical that will have to be, you know, hypothetically in in. Right us three's perfect America, um, that will have to be enforced. All I can, all I know is that I guess two things, one, this is what the saints have said, right. And we need to take what they have said very seriously, but then two, I'm also not smart enough to enact those things. <laughs> um, and so I would, I would defer it to, um, yeah, to some form of like just and legal system, if that was to ever occur. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too, you know, like if you bring this, this topic up to, um, you know, someone who's probably never heard it before and you, you presented, by the way, you presented it really well. Um, but, uh, you know, some people might have, uh, an aversion to it because they think of it not being able to be, uh, applied, um, in our particular situation right now, where they can't see how it could possibly work. Um, but they may agree on things like, well, under integralism, you most likely wouldn't be for uh you know free speech i think it was cool too on your on your instagram today we we're kind of talking about this earlier um that you mentioned you don't believe in free speech and i don't either you know i don't think anybody should be able to blaspheme um that is a very grave evil and it it certainly goes against our our end which is to know and to love and serve god but um i think I was listening to this other podcast today, um, Brian McCallahan, who's, uh, he's like a Federalist guy. And he was talking about how a lot of the, uh, oh, he was talking specifically about secession and how a lot of people's gut reaction is to not take any sort of conversation regarding secession. Their, their like knee jerk reaction is to say it's impossible. But uh, with integralism, I don't, I don't think it's, all that impossible i think it, it it's possible it's just we have to figure out how to implement it in our society today which is a very difficult thing to do uh you know the way that it is which leads me kind of to um one question that we have which is uh how would you refute the claim that catholic integralism is just globalism in a cassock um, this guy <laughs> hears this argument a lot, especially from people in conservative political circles, including fellow Catholics. I, first off, I really like the way that question is phrased. Uh, <laughs> Classic. That's good. Um, so this is the thing. So just taking Thomas as an example. Uh, well, let me first say this. There's no perfect form of government in the sense of, as an example, monarchy, aristocracy, republic. There are definitely betters. Uh, forms of government that St. Thomas says. Um, however, when it comes to applying intricalism, in a strict sense, it doesn't matter which form of government. Um, so let's just take, for instance, a republic, because I think that that's the most unconventional when it comes to intricalism. That's not what people typically think of. So Thomas says in his treatise on law that in order for a republic to work, uh, or if the ideal republic anyway, that there has to be uh, a well-educated and moral population that can enact laws or elect leaders to rightly fulfill their supernatural and their natural ends, right? That's just intricalism 101. 
Um, however, he does say that if those people are to, I think his exact quote is like to quote, put scallywags <laughs> or something to that effect, uh, or scoundrels, I think it is, like scoundrels into positions of office, mm -hmm. that those people have forfeited their, um, in essence, their, what we would deem as a right, their right to elect public officials, and that the government's power should be transplanted into the hands of a few good men. And so I guess how I would answer that specific question is, integralism isn't desirous to want to make one government over the entire world. It's not desirous to have the church as the government, but it's saying that governments all separated from each other should enact Catholic laws when it, when it comes to its morality, you know? And so I think maybe that question, um, or at least maybe the, the people that are um, talking to your listener, uh, I, I don't know if they necessarily have a, a complete understanding of integralism in the classical sense, because yeah, if the mentality is, okay, integralism is like, let's unite all of the world under one Catholic king who's also the Pope, that's not integralism, right? Um, and so yeah, integralism is very much so for, um, or can work with different forms of government. However, those governments merely just have to enact laws that are according to man's supernatural and natural end. Would not integralism kind of support more of a Holy Roman Empire idea, though, of the world? So I've, I've heard with people saying, because I hear I hear that whole thing where it's like, oh, well, it is this kind of globalism in a classic. It is actually this this belief that if you might as well be united under one church, what is to stop some one government? Now, I'm not of necessarily the opinion that, you know, the idea of one emperor is just an inherently bad idea or like a, or a, 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 an evil idea or something. It's interesting, but does it not support the idea that like we're in the Holy Roman Empire, it's like by the virtue of our baptism, we're all technically sons of the empire, right? So would that not like mm -hmm. kind of reinforce that a little bit more? It could, um, but I also think that that's how we perceive intricalism. So those are kind of the examples that we see throughout history. However, we have to ask ourselves, are those examples um, the pure philosophical sense of the word, mm. or are merely those just examples that come to mind. And so, for instance, like with the Holy Roman Empire, yes, th that was definitely intricalism playing itself out. And yes, um, baptism, you know, is, you know, that great rite of passage, so to speak, especially in those old days where they would also have seen you as a citizen. However, in the strict sense, intricalism isn't so much saying, should the church be the government and therefore your citizenship be baptism. Although the, I'm not saying that, you know, that idea is necessarily bad, but integralism is very much so interested in this idea that Catholic principles be incorporated into whatever form of government. And so um, unfortunately, the only examples that you can really get of a more maybe purely, um, a, a more pure example would be examples of like, you know, some of the great, some of the great Western countries pre their revolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, you know, just um, certain elements uh, that you would also see in societies that were already secular. So two good examples would be um, before the council, you saw both Spain and Italy, they both had as their national religions, Catholicism, right? Mm -hmm. And they also had laws that were not completely suppressing, but that were very much so aimed at deterring, say, Protestantism or some other form of religion from exercising themselves. However, those Protestants were still citizens of the country. You know, those Jews were still citizens of the country. Mm -hmm. However, post-council, um, the way you see Dignitatis Humanae interpreted is the Vatican asks Spain, asks Italy to get rid of those laws that make Catholicism the official religion of the country. Mm -hmm. And so, you see uh, very much so a reversal of, of intricalism being played out. So yeah, intricalism isn't necessarily tied in with like the world under, um, you know, the church and state 100% meshed, you know, as one entity, but rather it sees they're both two separate entities how, and that, you know, have their rightly ordered um, powers, temporal and spiritual. However, in this temporal world, we can't just pretend like nature uh, like, you know, body and soul are completely divorced from one another. Mm. You know, we have to also remember that, yeah, like, what we do to our bodies affects our soul and vice versa. Therefore, these laws have to be enacted in order to help man perpetuate, like, propel himself to his natural and supernatural end. Mm. Interesting.
Rudy, I, I want to kind of break down something you said earlier. You said that uh, in your kind of what would make a lot of sense is something like the outlaw of something like blasphemy. So maybe between the two of you, like what would, in terms of an integral estate, what would that actually look like though? You know, because it's one thing, like I think that in this country, by the virtue of just how we've seen things play out, I think that our, our, a lot of natural instinct is to be more Augustinian and Thomistic and approach integralism like okay look like just because something is an evil maybe even you know a, a deep evil what kind of thing do we kind of lay down so do you do you kind of see like is it like a fine is it like a what what where does this church or the state kind of get involved in that handoff <laughs> well if it were up to me uh... <laughs> <laughs> well if it were, yes yes <laughs> get your head chopped off but uh <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I, I, I wonder about that. Um, and I can't help but think about uh, um, that conversation that we had with Charles Colum, sort of around the same subject of Dignitatis Humanae. Uh, Dignitatis Humanae being the document that really gives the false equivocation of all the, like you mentioned, Nick, of all these different religions and uh, strips away the the, the Catholicism out of almost everything. Um, I think a proper, in the, in the context of that conversation, I think the proper uh, application of that, for example, and I'll give just one example, um, would be something that I struggle with is whenever I'm watching a TV show or a movie or something like that, and I hear a blasphemy, I don't think, that should be in there, right? Um, it would be something like um, pre '40s Hollywood, where yeah, these that. sorts of things wouldn't wouldn't Code. even make it to the screen. Uh, they wouldn't have the uh, you know like a big public broadcast the way that it is now. In the same way, pornography it would just be completely banned. It would be nearly impossible to to share it, mm -hmm. um, which. That's, I mean, that would be very difficult because of how technology is nowadays. Everything is so easily accessed. But um, yeah, this goes back to that question, Nick, of how do you implement all of this stuff? It's uh, definitely a head scratcher. But we yeah, know, it, like, we know that these things are important and then they, that we need to apply them into our culture because without, without this proper order, we're, we're sort of self destructing. Yeah, no, something has to happen. And that's the thing, you know, and what's so, what's so, I guess, infuriating is whenever you don't really have the power. And so the only thing you can do is kind of, um, you know, and I don't want to say this is kind of like, a, you know, a defeatist mentality, but yeah, kind of like hunker down your, your home, your castle, so to speak, you do what you can. But yeah. that's the thing. And that, that's one reason why, like on social media today, I was kind of lamb blasting against Republicans amongst of like why I'm not a Republican or a Democrat is I said, you know, they were fake conservatives, mm -hmm. which, you know, I, I see is true. But the re one reason I say that is because you don't see conservative, quote unquote, conservatives today taking any ground. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, for instance, when I was a kid, you would not have seen like any form of like conservatives, at least giving like a positive or even just like a tolerating view of like homosexuality mm. as an example you wouldn't have seen that um but now you have like you know like officially like as organizations like gay republicans right and and so you see that you know yesterday's you know liberals are today's conservatives and you know going on and on no. and so you don't see that taking any grounds so that's the hard question is like okay we know that these things are bad, but is really the fight to preserve faith, the fight to like preserve virtue, is it really just defensive or can't we go on the offensive? And I really think that men especially have to go on the offensive. I don't think men are just created just to def defend and that's it. I think mm -hmm. the men also right. should go out there. And if you want to make a difference, you have to make a difference. And I think so many men, they just struggle with that because they, they see, I guess, the system, so to speak, and, they're, and they think, oh, who am I? But I mean, not, not to sound like, a, I guess, a, a weird like prop pastor, but I mean, it was, this, it was the small one, right, in the book of Samuel, the young one, King David, mm -hmm. who by the power of God, like destroyed Goliath. And the idea is like, 
I'm not saying that you're David by any stretch of the imagination, but what I am saying is that you, we do need to have courage like David and trust in the Lord. And remember what David was fighting against. Goliath was specifically blaspheming God yeah. in that context. And so, for instance, like when we hear blasphemy, you know, the question is, is like, is it always charitable to, to reprove, right? Because we know that an accessory to sin, right, is silence at times. And so we also have to be prudent of like, who are we correcting if we should correct them in this connotation, right? Um, but especially when it comes to like, you know, you two are married and, you know, you'll have kids, um, you know, when you're in, the, in that fatherly role, you know, it's your natural end and your supernatural end to guide those, those children and your wives mm. to beatification, so... Have you ever read, have you, cause this is, this is actually one of our, one of our other questions from Instagram and it's does, you kind of talked about a little bit before, but does integralism always have to be incorporated with monarchy? Yeah. So it's typically associated with monarchy mainly because of history, I believe. Um, because again, all the great integralist states you see in the medieval period and they're all monarchies, but it doesn't have to be mm. um, at all. Um, you know, so going back to that example of Thomas and his um, treatise on law, it can work with um, a republic. It can work with a, an aristocracy. Um, and, you know, Aquinas's political beliefs, everyone I feel like likes to, <laughs> likes to debate on like specifically what form of government. There's definitely sections in like, for instance, I think it's the Deregno, forgive me if I'm wrong, but where he talks about like monarchy is the best form of government. But then the question is, is he just kind of you know, saying this in front of the king, so to speak, saying <laughs> great form of government. Um, well, it's not funny this because I think that even just by naturally, um, I feel like it's like Jordan Peterson's dominance, hi dominance hierarchies, but I think we're naturally wired for monarchy. I think it's not a surprise in a way that God institutes the kingdom as a kingdom, you know, and I, I think that any prudent king ought to have his, his estates that he listens to and draws counsel from, which is why I, I I like the setup of the medieval state because I think that because it's not in the confines of what we think of when we think of modern governance, it's by its nature decentralized. Um, the king only has as much power as his lords are really able to band together with him or without him. And so what you kind of see is like, and you know, he always the, the church has the ability, the Pope has the ability to excommunicate a, a bad king. Um, and, and an evil king in the actual sense of the word. And so what I like is, it seems to me like on one hand, integralism has been described to me as like this marrying of the, the miter and the scepter. And I think that it's far more of a healthy interaction. I recently read um, Father uh, John O'Malley's A History of the Papacy, 2000 year history of the papacy. And it's funny, as you've talked about, you know, Christianity going from underground to not just a recognized and even the religion of the empire, but literally the one of the very few bastions of civilization and the consolidation of just pragmatic power standing at the fall of the Roman Empire. Your bishop was the only one in your region who's going to be able to consolidate power from a bunch of petty lords enough for them to get along with each other. So it makes sense that we kind of see throughout the Germanic states and other places where you do have the church taking on more temporal authority in certain cases, because what else are you going to rally around? Um, have you ever have you ever read Star Spangled Crown by Charles Coulomb? I have not. No. Okay. I would. I I'm a uber huge fan of that book, and one of the reasons is because I it lays out essentially what would happen if a revolution instituted a monarchy in the United States, and almost it's like it's like an ahistorical what if. So it's a very pragmatic and practical kind of layout of if these scenarios happen, this is how. A monarchy ought to be looked at and it's this catholic monarch coming in who wants to make sure that catholicism is the, the dominant force that integralist perspective but obviously still has to sit down and go okay well what are we going to do with the fact that this nation's roots are very protestant you know and how do we pragmatically work through that and i thought it was a really really good kind of example of how of an integralism more that i'm attuned to i'm always interested in like the what should be a, an evil that is actually criminally shrined in the law? Like, you know, I think one, one you know, a murders or obviously abortions, all this one, you know, but then what happens when there are other things that you realize a hand might be a little bit different? What do you do about adultery uh, after what Christ did with adultery? You know, do you capitalize adultery? Well, obviously it's a scandal of sin and it can scandalize the entire public, you know, 
is a virtue of skin being a sin being scandalous enough to make it criminal, right? Do you create more evils? And in this country, people talk about with prohibition, well, that was just proof that you can't legislate morality. So they use that and they go, okay, as a result, like let the state create marriage in its own image and all these other kinds of things. Um, so what I kind of been trying to find the balance of with, with integralism is what do I see as, as both making sure that like the basis of the state is not just a natural law, but also the fact that Christ church is the church. It's not one, it's not one prince amongst many. It is the prince. Um, but also making sure that like, I don't, you don't want to like throw people in jail or do something adverse that also is just the human reality of sin. Do you potentially go too far in that sort of direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And that's a great, that's a great distinction. And um, one of my best friends, uh, she's like the smartest person I know my age. She talks about this and it's true. Oftentimes I think as guys, we, it, we want to see one solution, yeah. right? Oh, and that would be just so nice, right? It'd be so nice if there was a button that we could go, we could sneak into the Vatican and we saw, hey, the crisis button is on. We just push it and it's over. It's like, have um, you seen the young Pope where he has that, that button underneath his desk? <laughs> yeah, ask, Cardinal, are you a homosexual? Like, yeah. Oh man, that, yeah, it just, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but I think... She, one time when, when she and I were discussing something very similar to this, we were talking, I don't know if we were talking about integralism, but we were talking about how do you make like a good Catholic society mm -hmm. in essence, like especially here in America. And really what it is, is it's not just the leaders, but it's everyone who has to make that conceited effort in rightly ordering their lives. So whether that's, you know, in our great world, the king right there at the, at the helm or the mailman or the nursing mother at home, are they living their authentic Catholic life and therefore culture itself just naturally is progressing along that, you know, that's, that's, what's so important. And of course, laws do matter. I'm reminded even just like with uh, Rudy's example of like blasphemy, I believe it was King Louis the ninth who, whenever, uh, you know, people would blaspheme or hear people were blaspheming in his country, I believe, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe that he went and like branded the tongues of most of the citizens who were doing this and they were like crying out for mercy and he didn't listen to them. Um, and so, yeah, like I'm not necessarily advocating for that either, but then there also is a very good argument of being like, well, we can't tolerate these things. And so, you know, I don't know where the, where the line is or like how we should talk about it. I do know this though, is that if we have, before we talk about integralism, we need to talk about getting the church's interior life back. Yeah. <laughs> Because like once the church is healthy, then we can go like push forward. Because if we do have a church where, you know, you know, like statistically post COVID 12% of Catholics are going to mass, mm -hmm. this is ridiculous. Um, like, you know, the often example that traditionalists will throw out is like, yeah, if we owned a business, right. And there was only 12% of our clientele that was showing up or only 12% of our, you know, employees that were showing up and of that 12%, like a good chunk of them don't even believe in what the store believes in, you know, we're not doing really well. So I think like the first thing we need to do is like humble ourselves, ask Christ to like go and reform. So we need saints, right? We need saints to come now and really clean up the church. And then once the church is in a healthy state, if that's what God's grace is, then the, the practical questions of like, how does a Catholic society will start to flourish? Mm. That reminds me too of, you know, um, the home life is really important. You know, if you're the head of the household, being the supreme monarch of your home, you're instilling these values into your family and the family then is going out into the world and, and sort of germinating these ideas out into the public sphere. Um, I think eventually, and you know, when the church gets everything together and the restoration of the church is complete, the, the germination can begin in the culture. No. Yeah. There's a, you know, what? it's anal analogous to how I've, Rudy and I talked about this a lot. What would you do in order to promulgate the Latin mass in today's church culture? And the answer is it's naturally doing what it's supposed to do. I mean, we, we did, we did an episode on demographics of the Latin mass and what the future looks like. And the world's gonna be so different by 2030. It's gonna be kind of absurd. And yeah. you know, it's back and forth and like, well, well, the church 
shouldn't operate, at least I don't think the papacy operates well when the stroke of one pope's pen outdoes the stroke of another pope's pen, obviously, because popes ought to stand on the shoulders of giants and on the tradition of the church. And we've lost in, in the last scramble of the past, you know, since the council, we've really lost, well, actually it's before the council because the, the consolidation of the modern world has also meant that popes have just by their nature become more visible and also more vocal for positive or worse. Um, the amount of papal encyclicals that were written prior to the 1800s was doing this and then it's it spikes and now it keep now it's like we expect it you know the amount of people who in the middle ages cared what pope was on the throne was relatively little thank god because the church survived the pornocracy and all these other kinds of things um and so it's kind of worrying where and as trads we know this too like that that being careful of falling into those cults of personality that you know we ought to just take the tradition and and you know we we tweak as God allows things to tweak and talk about and reform things as ought to be reformed, but not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so my entire philosophy on that is like, if I was Pope Leo the 14th, because that's what name I would take, uh, you know, it wouldn't be just a stroke of the pen that would abolish the new mass. Just as, as there were there were documents in the 70s that were supposed to just wipe away the old mass just immediately. And they were never signed and thank God that never happened. Because if you do that, you open the door to essentially uh, a bad pope, you know, reversing these sorts of things. Far better is it to have that healthy interior life of the church. You instead make the proposition of, if you know the deep philosophies and theologies and beauties of the mass, why would you ever go back to the mass of Paul VI? That, would, that wouldn't make any sense, you know? It's like, uh, Rudy and I are married, right? And we know the depths and beauties, not just of our wives, but of the sacrament of marriage. So why would we look at pornography or be adulterers? There's just, it, you know, there's no rhyme or reason. And I think that that kind of basis you were talking about, like that, that deep interior life, the return of it, means that some things that are so hard for us to fathom as contemporary Catholics, what, what a pre-code Hollywood looks like, which once upon a time was just like the normal place for people, wasn't, wasn't a thing. Uh, a league of decency, these sorts of these sorts of funny little words. Um, I think it just becomes easy to accept because the the life of the culture is obviously a lot more naturally oriented towards Christ. Yes, hundred percent. And I, I really like your example. Um, and I think what needs to happen is that people often, again, like even with your example of the new mass, they want to just a one shot fits all. Right. And, and they right. think that that's going to solve it, but it's, it's, it's not at the end of the day. And, you know, that'd be amazing if it did, but that's just not realistic. But I think really, you know, for most people, if they want to see an intricalist state or if they're wanting to see something like it, yeah, going back and doing a good interior life is important. But then with that interior life, an interior life at the end of the day means nothing if the virtue of fortitude is not practiced. And that's really the key. And I, so many, and so what I mean is you can spend all you want in the chapel. You can spend all you want in the library, but if you don't take what you've learned in the chapel and what you've learned in the library and mesh them together, but then move out into the street, move out into the culture, it's, it, it's not going to matter any, you know? And so that's one thing I, I, I really do worry about is that so many trads are, I guess, so introspective on the church, which is fair, right? But they're not, they don't seem to be very interested when it comes to other things. So for instance, I have a really good friend who's a traditionalist as well. He's very drawn to Franciscan style mm -hmm. theology. So of course we have all the, the classic Dominican versus Franciscan <laughs> mm -hmm. inner, inner wars going on. But like, as an example, he, right, is a traditionalist, but he goes and hangs out under bridges with the homeless and brings them to church. Nice. Right. He wants, he wants the homeless. Yeah. He wants the homeless to be saved. Mm -hmm. Right. How many of the, how many of those angry, so to speak, uh, you know, trads, which again, there's lots to be angry about are going to, you know, go out to the homeless. Right. And I'm not saying of course, right. Therefore just run in that direction and be imprudent with things. But my point is, is like, are we loving theology or are we loving Jesus? Mm. Right. And I don't want to separate the two. Obviously your love of Christ wants you to, you, you study more as a result and vice versa, but 
if you want an integral state, you have to first go back and examine your own self and say, am I even practicing the faith? Am yeah. I doing corporal acts of mercy? Am I go do I have a frequent confession life? Am I praying the rosary every day? Am I going to mass as often as I possibly can? You know, these types of things. Am I spiritually reading for people who are married? Am I the, am I the guy who, you know, is just constantly flying off at the time? Or, you know, especially for guys, I don't know if you guys have had a show on this. I, I thought about having one on here soon, but uh, one on the subject of effeminacy mm. that so many guys need to struggle with. And so it's like, for some guys, do you have a set routine schedule that you wake up in the morning or, you know, do you, do you have the habit of just sleeping in all the time? Like, do you, uh, you know, for some guys take cold showers just because, you know, it's painful and you need to learn a little bit of suffering. Do you have a workout routine? Do you, do you enjoy, or at least, um, do you try your best at your, your secular work? When we ask these questions, we can grow. And if we all do this together, you know, God will propel us into that, like that great Catholic civilization that we want. Yeah. Mm. We're going to have to have you back on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's killer. Uh, in our last little bit of time, uh, thank you for, for being on with us so much. Is there any, what would you say is your, the, the biggest legitimate critique maybe of integralism that you could kind of think about? I think the, I guess my biggest critique of integralism would be, um, and I don't know if this is necessarily, I guess my biggest critique is that it's not 100% fleshed out ultimately at the end of the day, is that this is a very much a philosophy that though it has great bones, has a lot of muscle that needs to be built. And so mm. like going back to what we we're talking about earlier, those really practical questions, there's really not a lot of um, concrete solutions, um, which is true about really any political philosophy. If you think yeah. about it, I don't think it's necessarily unique to integralism, but I think as someone who really does desire in that Thomistic mindset answers, right. right. Just leaving it kind of up in the air and being like, well, I guess it depends on like the country and how they enforce integralism can definitely like rack my brain and make me upset. But overall, I think the philosophy is a sound philosophy because, um, it really does take into account, um, that man is uh, an animal, but yet a spiritual animal, right? An, a rational animal. And it doesn't try to divorce the two. And so if you think about it, um, again, to, to airdrop a, a spicy name, but Marcel Lefebvre, he talks about how, if you think about it, if a state doesn't, in essence, have a version of integralism, what's the result? Mm. The result is, um, you know, state atheism, if you think about it, or state indifferent. That's just the, the, the natural result that you have if you don't have um, God as the primary. Mm. Absolutely great. Nick, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to have to have you on for again for some little bit more fun. Thank you, everybody who's been listening. If you liked uh, what Nick had to say, and let's be honest, we know that you did, please go ahead and subscribe to his channel. It's called The Traditional Thomist. He has a lot of cool guests, including yours truly, as well as a lot of absolutely stellar things to say. And I see that, see that totally, total pride, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you everybody for watching. Please, we'd love to hear your own comments, especially on integralism. So if you want, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Do all those YouTube and podcasty things you gotta do. If you want to support us, and uh, the most important thing you can do is keep us in your prayers. But if you'd like to go just a little bit deeper, uh, we also have a Patreon, so you can check that out. That will include things like early episodes, as well as your ability to uh, suggest episodes for us, and even Patreon-only exclusive episodes. So go ahead and check that out if that's something that interests you. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. From all of us here, God bless you, and may I keep you. We'll see you on the next one. Oh, me.